Hey, Stuart. <laughs> Just going to wait for some people to um, join. Da -da -da. Always takes a little while. Let's see who we get joining us. Lives are so interesting, man. Oh, I'm so excited. Da, da, da. Oh, Stuart, I'm buzzing for this. I'm buzzing. Let's just let um give people some time to to jump on hey natasha hey girl thank you for joining literally just waiting for a few more people to to jump on da -da -da. Da -da. this lighting is awful but it is what it is yes holly Holly in the building. <laughs> oh boy, Holly. I love this girl, man. And it, Holly's in the building. Hey, Yinka. Literally just waiting for a few more people to uh, join, guys, and then we'll um we'll get stuck into it. It's a meaty one, so and I don't necessarily want to repeat myself, so I'm just going to wait for a few more people to jump in. Hey, Deval, nice to have you. <laughs> Holly, you joker. Do you know what though? You know what I thought you was gonna do, Holly? Just kind of split your time. I mean, what what can you do? <laughs> the family's too big, man. Family's too big. Yes, Deval. I'm literally just waiting for a few more people to join because this is gonna be a meaty one and I don't necessarily want to be repeating myself. So um and obviously I want to give Stuart all the time that he needs to share some some tea <laughs> with you guys not even spill share you're gonna have to take that tea and sip on it i might just give it another minute or so and then we'll just we'll just crack on deval you're always hungry <laughs> you're literally always hungry come on Yes, Trey, how you doing? Where are all the people, man? This is the first time on a Thursday. Maybe there's many lives. Maybe there's many lives. Stuart, I'm going to bring you in. Just waiting for Stuart. There he is. There he is. Let me make sure. It's your volume up. Yeah, can you hear me? There we go, I can hear you now. How you doing? Hey, good. Thank you so much for having me on. No worries. Yeah, right, let's get into this. Let's give everyone the yeah, meat. Yeah, some of you up. may know, some of you may know that on the 7th of May, I launched Surviving Lockdown on uh, Instagram Live. The whole point of that was to offer people some light relief during the times, to have some fun, but then to offer you tips for surviving lockdown. We're 12 weeks into lockdown. Some people have been doing lockdown for 80 plus days. You don't need any tips from me for surviving lockdown. We've also had uh, really heavy things going on around the world. I know you all know what I'm speaking about. Uh, and during that time, I just needed to pause. I think a lot of people did. And whilst I was on pause, I was reflecting. I wanted to come back to IGTV. People were asking me to return. But I couldn't return with the same thing. No offense to anybody, but surviving lockdown is dry when we're actually surviving lockdown. So I thought, what else can I do? How can I use my platform to benefit you guys? I decided to come back with a show called Amplified and that's what this is. It serves two purposes. One, still to offer light relief from the current times and to have some fun with that. But two, to give someone else the opportunity to have their voice be heard in support of the current movement. So at the end of this show, there is a new segment called Echo or Message in support of Black Lives Matter. And essentially what I'm gonna ask my uh, guests to do is echo the voice of one who paved the way, for example, our ancestors, 
or they can send a direct message to today's oppressors, or maybe they might want to do both. Minanua. But I know there's certain people who watch these lives after they've been live, and some of them are white racists who are our oppressors. So I figured this is a good way to get a message to them. <laughs> so with that said, if you don't know who the hell I is, my name is Charlie. I'm an award-winning blogger, uh, rated one of the top 50 blogs in the UK to go and read alongside Marie Claire magazine by Feedspot UK. I also present on radio. I host live events. I'm a mentor for aspiring uh, talents and I'm an advocate for positive young leaders. I can't get enough of what young people are doing at the moment. Some of them are making the way, literally. So I'm going to let my guest introduce himself to you and then we're going to jump into our topic with a little disclaimer. I feel like I have to put one in there. So over to you, my love. Who are you and what do you do? Hey, guys. So, hey, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Stuart McKenzie. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm, I used to run a production company with the living legend Nathan Bryan called Cool Beans. We used to make a lot of comedy sketches uh, where I first met you, Charlie, going on your radio show. Um, and now I'm a recording artist and a writer. So I'm getting ready to release my debut single soon. Uh, which is called Release It, because it's taken me five years to release anything musical. <laughs> <laughs> so I was Take like, some time for us all. <laughs> and I'm writing a book, uh, which I've been writing for the last two years. It's called White Men, We Are The Problem, which does what it says on the tin. Yeah. Which okay. Yeah. Which Amazing. Sure. Two things for me, Stuart. Is there any way you can steady your... Are you using your phone? Oh, yeah, I'm holding it just because I thought otherwise it would be too white. I could try and balance it on something. Yeah, see if you can balance it. I just think it would be a little bit easier for you and a little bit better visually for the people watching. Okay, is that... There you go! And then also see if you can turn your volume up because I'm still struggling to hear you a little bit. Oh, do you know what's so bad is that basically my phone cracked, so I feel like the speaker is just a bit... Peak my oh. Is that... Wait, is that... I just get closer to it. Is that better? <laughs> this is what I love about lives, though. This is this is real life. This is real life. Hey, Michael. Michael's just joined us. Nice to have you. Okie dokie. So we're going to get into this, but I need to put a disclaimer. Yes. When I've been promoting uh, Amplified, the show today, I've literally been putting on the little poster, and obviously with Stuart's approval, that he is white, he is gay, he has a black partner. Uh, he's actively anti-racist. He's an artist. He is outspoken. He does not hold back. This is why he and I connect. But just a little disclaimer. Obviously, there are going to be things that we say that might offend you. That's not our intention at all. The intention is to share openly because now is the time to do that. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you don't feel that you can um, accept anything that's being said, just bounce. You're not contractually obligated to be here. And I mean that in the nicest way. But Stuart is my friend. I have a lot of love uh, and support and, and care for him. So, I mean, you can, you can give me all the crap you want to give me, but I'm not going to have it where, when it comes to Stuart. So try and just hold it down if there's anything that we say that you, you feel offended by. And also, you are going to get an opportunity to have your say, people, as always. So let's get into this. I mean, people who, who, who know you, uh, they know what you're about. They know that you're gay. It's obvious you're white. I can see that from your skin. Uh, and, and you have a black partner. So freaking what? But let's start there. Because you being a gay man, you've had your fair share of nonsense. Your partner has had his fair share of nonsense. In terms of the current times, how does it feel to not only be gay, but also dating a black man <laughs> and to be white and to openly support black people. That's, that in itself is, it, I mean, that's a lot of heavy. I've got to take a sip of water. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, life is intense. Like, of course, life is intense. But it's first, the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's an honor. Like I'm honored, firstly, that you'd even give me this space. So thank you, sister. But in relation, in regards to my relationship, it's an honor to be with Matthew, particularly with for who he is, not only just what he is as a black man, as a black queer man. He's taught me so much through not only what he is, but who he is. And I feel like as a white gay person, as a white gay man, because obviously the intersection of patriarchy there, it's, it's so humbling, but it's also so empowering for me to learn 
the differences between oppression because the one thing I really, which I feel like I've been on top of for a long time, but the thing I really can't stand is white gay guys who feel like we can claim that we've been oppressed because we're gay. And that's not to say right. that, and that's not to say that we don't suffer homophobia, but if right. you're going to start comparing homophobia as a white person to racism, I'm going to have to shut you down immediately because I could, you could just put me in a suit and tie. I could sit down and say nothing and I get all the privilege that are given to any right. white person. Right. So yeah, when I start talking, of course I have effeminate isms, whatever you could pick up that I'm gay, but even still, I will still get white privilege. And even now with the development of, of LGBTQI rights, of course, white privilege is prominent in that too. So yeah. even as a, even as an out gay white man, I still get so much privilege afforded to me, even though I'm from a minority. But and even that, the word minority, I'm glad is being readdressed at the moment. Um, Amen. But yes, so I just can't personally. I can't. I can't uh, support any white gay person who feels that their oppression is more important, or uh, or means that that's their reason to not support Black Lives Matter. You know, like if there's a white yeah. gay guy that's like, yeah, but what about me? Like my gay life, my white gay life matters. Yeah, <laughs> it does. No, no, not right now, bro, and and not in the way that Black Lives Matter. Yeah, yeah I hear you on that. Yeah. I mean, you've been you've been on protests for as long as I've known you. You've always been vocal about uh, you know, the the things that I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but basically just the oppression that Black people feel in general, or that they've faced the racism. Um, I know you've witnessed uh, Black people, you know, dealing with certain things. What does it feel like when you are? on those protests how does it feel to be amongst so many black people to not have those black people necessarily know and understand why you're there right and to perhaps sometimes look at you and ill judge you because obviously the fight and the move is about white oppression you we can't get away from the color of your skin so what does it feel like when you go on these protests it feels incredible like the first the first response it's intense just to obviously be dealing with this with the reality of this but to be out on the streets protesting just feels incredible because really there's no, I've not personally received or felt like I've been receiving any looks like mm. that. If anything, it's just solidarity, you know, like black people, everyone is just happy that we're here. Like just that anyone yeah. shows up, particularly with white people who, anyone who's been trying to join in the echo chamber of posting online and stuff, people are saying, oh, what can I do to be anti-racist? What can I do to be an ally? If you feel safe, if you feel healthy, if you're not worried about Corona, getting out on the streets and, and adding your number to the numbers is a huge act of solidarity. And I think that's mm -hmm. the most prominent thing that I've felt for sure in these protests yeah. right, is, is unity, for sure. The government have had a, a lot to say, the MPs have had a lot to say uh, about the protests. There's, there's a lot of negativity that's surrounding the protests. Some people, including some black people, are saying that the protests are pointless. We can see what the protests have resulted in, all of which has been positive, except for the, the small bits and bobs of trouble that we've seen. When you've been on this protest, these protests, have you seen any trouble? Have you been involved in any trouble? Has, have the police uh, started any trouble? So, yeah, like you kind of, yeah, you said wow. that the police really are the ones that start the trouble. So. Uh, we went, we've been to all four of the protests that were here uh, in London and it was last Saturday was the first time that I saw any trouble because usually after you have the meeting point and you go on the march, uh, then you have the kind of end destination of the march. After that, the organisers will usually say, okay, disperse the crowd and then pockets of the crowd will go to different uh, places, one of them being 10 Downing Street. I don't know if wow. you've seen the clip of what happened with the head top lick off of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. But, so basically they started charging at us. Like, I think even I saw Sister Isis is in this live now. Um, they started charging at us. Like, we were standing there. Uh, actually, it was incredible because the heavens opened just when we got to 10 Downing Street. And it was like, just that feeling of being in the rain and being together. And like I said, that unity yeah. power. Um, and it was almost like that energy was so powerful that the police then felt like they had to do something violent, which is so telling. You know, oh, yes, there's ISIS. Um, it's just so telling, you know, because after we were all kind of in this spirit of just energy and togetherness, power, mm -hmm. we, we're standing there, we all start taking a, a knee for King George, the real King yeah. George. Uh, and then as we're all on one knee, we turn to our right and just see a whole line of police forces come charging at us. And we're like, there was women there with children. There was like, even just far from where we were was a buggy with a baby. The power, oh, wow. the quickness of that is like, they had no, re 
as I said, the frequency. Was yeah, the frequency was too high. It sounds like it. Like that, they literally they charged us with the courses, and it's like, what if mm. you would have trampled somebody? What if you would have trampled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody? Like with a child, like it's just it was so. So when it comes to the protests, it's it's the police that clearly are the problem. I did see a, a news report. There's a young American uh, lady. I think she's about 26. She's a mum of two. Um, her name is Nia or Naya, however she pronounces it. Naya Love, and she had one of those pellet guns. Uh, hit her eye and her eye was blown out her, her her eye has been blown out now the interesting thing in america and i don't know if anybody else knows this but if they shoot those pellet those little soft pellet thingy guns i say soft but they obviously they cause damage they don't have to register that shot so technically that girl has not been shot so she does have a, a lawyer she is trying to fight the case but it's incredibly difficult when in that case she had three, there were three units, three different units were sent to this one spot where there were peaceful protests. This particular girl with a group of other black people were walking in the opposite direction because the protest was about to end. She simply looked around to check for her brother and that pellet has gone in her eye and her eye has exploded. That's like a thousand times more intense than when you go and do paintballing. So you can imagine the pain and that's in your eye. So... There's a lot of people that are claiming that the protests are not doing their job because there's violence, but the violence clearly from your mouth, from the mouth of Nia Long and from the mouth of so many other people is coming from the police, which is ridiculous. Why is it so important to you to, to be part of this movement? I mean, you've been part of this movement before the movement even became a thing, to be honest. You've always been pro-black and, and just in support of us in terms of the crap that we go through. Why? Why is it so important? I know you love off your black people. I'm just going to say it. But why? <laughs> what is it about us? <laughs> wow, that's such a powerful question. I feel like, well, firstly, my whole life, as you know, anyone who knows me, I've always had close black friends. I feel like... As a white person, you can do either one of two things. You can either admit the way that we love and need black people in our lives and black culture in our lives. And not even just when you look at the history of the development of Europe and America and just of the Western world has all come up yeah. to exploit in Africa. So we, and then music, everything, come on, like you don't need me to tell you, like add everything about white European culture that is that has value has been influenced and affected by black culture and black people. And I think as a white person, Facts. you're given a choice that you either can accept that and embrace that and do so lovingly and with a full heart, or you can completely deny that and become petrified of it and go with the whole like myth that white people created life and created the world and created mm -hmm. do you know mm -hmm. Or like what's really happening now is that, yeah, this, especially because we've all had three months to just basically sit and stew in our mental health. Hey, Dwayne. Now, now is the time to to show that. Because even when you're saying with me, I've always been pro-black, even in always loving black people and living with black people, I've never always got it right. And I still won't always get it right because I am. Yeah, black. yeah. That's the most important thing for all white people and all allies. And even just for people who aren't black, whether you're Asian, whoever it is to accept, is that we will never know the black experience. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100. And accepting that creates automatically creates a space you know a space where you can mm -hmm. a, a place where you can try to understand and i feel like yeah there are even i've seen a few people come into this live now friends of mine who have really held my hand along the way you know in terms of yeah. appropriation, particularly as a white gay man in regards to appropriation is such an important thing i think to be discussed by obviously by white gay men but just as a whole you know the way that so many things that as white people we've taken that it's now time to really address. It's always yeah, been time it to address it, but now I'm just so grateful that this time has come yeah. to the surface and it's just everybody is is a part of it's interest it's interesting in terms of um it's interesting in terms of history because I had this discussion with with a black person the other day who refuses to accept that we're all African at the end of the day. They they don't have a real understanding of what happened in 1619 and it's, it's interesting because all of this information is, is readily available now it doesn't take you know a, a lot for you to go and find out that it was 19 slaves back in 1619 coincidentally who were taken from africa that's where they were taken from do you know what i mean so wh where, where do you think it all started from it's, it's really interesting the debate especially within the black community and that's another chat for another day i did put on on my instagram 
in a post that black people, in some ways, we're so disconnected. We come together for a time, we come together for a cause, and then we're done. And we wonder why we have to keep repeating the fight. I don't know what the disconnect is, but it needs to be healed. And until there is a black person that actually stands up and says, we need to have that conversation, well, we're never going to be healed. And so sometimes I think because of that, we do ourselves as black people a disservice. So it's very interesting when we get, not that it's right, it's never right for anybody to be oppressed, but the way in which black people have been oppressed is disgusting, but we don't, in my opinion, stay connected and unified long enough to see the results we need to see in order for there to be a chance that it will stop. Do you know what I'm saying? Our ancestors did that. When people say that, you know, the protests don't work, Rosa Parks protested. So now black people can sit on a bus with white people. If that isn't a result, that one example, I, I, I don't get where people are coming from. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's really, really interesting. Have you ever had, you know, from, from white people who might be racist or white people who kind of just don't get you in terms of your support of black people, have you ever had a white person try to actually turn you and, and, and be racist or, you know, just kind of be anti-black people? So there's this one. Oh no. <laughs> Let me get my water again. <laughs> um, do you know uh, Aldershot Aldershot is like this place where basically the yes yes are. yes yeah yeah well done. so don't hey, Zach. And why yeah so with an ex-partner um his friend lived or lives I don't know lived in Aldershot and they were having a St George's Day party so think right. red, the red cross the red cross flags are already going off in my mind yeah I'm like shit okay wait so George's Day party in Aldershot, there's going to be a lot of... Sorry, Stuart. Let me pause you just for one second, because this is interesting from Dwayne. He's saying, Charlie, do you feel it could be the lack of education of our culture we get in our schools? And not only that, the soon to be extinct grand grandparents that share our culture stories. That is so interesting. Here's the thing. And this is my personal opinion. When I was growing up, I grew up in a single parent household. That's my mother. She's got three children. She educated us. She didn't rely entirely on the education system to do that. And I do understand why certain parents do do that. And, and in my opinion, it's wrong, but I get why they do it. So all of my education in terms of my history, my culture, the Caribbean or uh, Africa or Dominica, wherever in the world my family come from, I learned that from my mother. And then because I had a genuine interest, I took it upon myself to always go and study and to learn. And whatever I didn't understand, I would ask. I still do that to this day. If, if I don't know something, I'm going to ask. Or I jump on a Carlos page. I'm not going to lie on Instagram because my guy is knowledgeable to the highest high. Um, so I kind of think, I think yes, but I think that that shouldn't be an excuse. And, and I know that I'm going to get some stick for this, but I do think a lot of people, a lot of black people in, in particular, they're too quick to find excuses for why they have not done something or why they cannot do something or why something can't be consistent. And, and it, it, it bothers me. It's like the, um, the video that you sent me, Dwayne, of that guy who was, who was saying, you know, black people should stop protesting because protesting doesn't, doesn't work because he had one experience where he felt like it wasn't working. That don't make any sense to me. Don't tell black people that protesting doesn't work because it does. Leave them doing their protesting. They are seeing results. Them statues coming down is results and we needed those statues to come down all of them in my opinion should come down i don't want to be walking down a street and a statue that embodies what slavery was all about what it represented is standing over me modern day slavery is human trafficking that's still going on those statues need to come down modern day slavery is debt bondage that's still going on those statues need to come down i could go on but i don't have the time so for me as much as this sounds like an attack Dwayne, it isn't you know me um I, I can't stand with black people who don't look to also get educated. It's not because we are the ones being oppressed that we can stand up and say, well, we know everything about what, well, no, we don't actually. There's things that I've learned recently because of this new fire in our bellies, because of the George Floyd situation that had me go, wow, why didn't I know that already? I've always known about Jim Crow, for example, but I didn't know about all of his laws. There was one law in particular where Jim Crow said, if a police officer wants to shoot dead a Negro because they feel threatened, they can do that. Oh, what the ass. Hence why some, some cops maybe in America seem to think that they can blatantly get away with killing black people. It ain't cool. So I hear you, Dwayne. And on one side of the coin, I'm like, yes. But on the other side of the coin, I'm like, no. 
we as black people also need to make sure we are educated. We need to consistently keep on with the fight. We need to stay unified, in my opinion. Uh, if you guys, hey, Simply Ryan, if you guys haven't already, James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni, a conversation on YouTube, really recommend watching this. It's long but powerful and it's talking to what you're saying, Charlie. Thank you, girl. I'm going to do that. Thank you so much. Um, Stuart, I cut you off. Sorry. Dwayne, Dwayne's question was, it, it was so sick. And I was like, I don't, because it scrolls up. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not that good on Instagram also, live. I'm not going to lie. It's a perfect example for me. I just said the Willie Lynch like, theory. Uh, Oh, yeah. And she also said that apparently they've taken that statue out of the Harperford Museum. Whatever. Gross. Yeah, um, good. But, in terms of but they're looking at reciting these um, these statues. And that's a fight I would take on single-handedly if I had to. Uh, Thank you, Dwayne. I'm He's saying that he agrees. I'm cane off of Churchill's statue. Uh, yeah. No. Do you remember what you were saying? Because I cut you off. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, no, no. I about know, the, the, the oldest... Okay, great. Well, about you. Uh, like, yeah. I'm not even cutting me off. Just putting me on pause. I think it's so important as white people and as allies now that conversation is between you and Dwayne. Do you mean it's for you as black people? Even when you were talking about black unity, that's not my part of this show. Do you mean that's not part of my, that's not my part, that's not my portion, that's not my discussion. So yeah, I like, please, you wouldn't, I'm so glad that you put me on pause. That was perfect. Uh, <laughs> as white people, we need to get used to being paused. Just in the moment, pause. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, for a try. I mean, you <laughs> said it, you said it. White people pay attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so you yeah, continue, my tab, love. The tab about older shots. So basically, what was I even thinking going to older shot on a St. George's Day party? I knew there was going to be horrendous, but I still went. <laughs> like, oh, God. Um, and yeah, just it took what even like five, ten minutes of being with just these army guys for them to say something racist, for them to just show themselves, for them just to expose themselves. And of course, straight away, I just went straight into the talk. I was like, no, I was like, no, like, you know that this is, this is the end of the end. Like, yeah, I is going to crumble and you either build a bridge out of it or you crumble in it. Like, it's that simple. Like, and just basically the guys who, the guy whose house it was, he ended up having like a really intense episode. Like, he just was basically trying to dead me in his house. Like, he started smashing up. Ah! Yeah, he started smashing up his own house. Yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> telling me to leave. So obviously. about that. No, I had to leave, obviously, but it was just. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but he was just. Do you face anything like that today? Is there? Is there an? You know, when you when you go anywhere or go somewhere, because a lot of black people have this. There's always an assumption that we are going to be a particular way or speak a particular way because we're black. Do you ever? And I've never asked a white person this, right? But sometimes I think what black people go through, let's park the oppression for a minute, but what black people go through in terms of having, we're always reminded that we're black. Every situation you are reminded that you're black. Before you leave your home, you have to consider your blackness. Am I gonna be too loud? Do I need to turn the volume down? I need to watch what I do with my hands because I might be seen as a threat. It, it, it's a lot. How am I dressed? How is my hair? It's way too much. And that is just because you are black. It's not even about you having insecurities. It's about protecting yourself. Do you ever show up in a space where you feel there is a particular expectation of you based on the color of your skin? Absolutely. Are you expected to behave a certain way, speak a certain way, be involved in certain things just because of the color of your skin? I think, and that's a really powerful question, I think uh, what white privilege does or what I've experienced white privilege has done for me is create a space- Hey, Zach open, huh? I'm just saying hi to Zach Ross, sorry. <laughs> I love these people. I love when they show up and they say, hi, bless. I'm so sorry. Joanne, hey. Oh, I'm Joanne. oh bless. And so, yeah, I feel like what my experience of white privilege has given me my whole life is the space to state myself. Right. So, right. So that no, at, no matter what time, at any given time, actually, I'm an individual. And even if I'm up against a group of people, I still would maintain myself as the individual. Right. I do you mean I'm in this bubble of white privilege that in a very is that ever challenged is that ever challenged you being a white person walking into a yeah. space being afforded the privilege of just being whoever you want to be in that moment is that ever challenged uh I think not based on me being white no I can't say I've ever experienced that and if I would have ever experienced that my interpretation of it wouldn't have been so do you mean I guess because of just the way that I've been programmed the way I've been conditioned is just to see myself as Stuart, do you know what I mean? And that's, that's the part of white privilege that I think me and every other white person has to really accept that that's what yeah. racism 
has done to black people like you're saying yeah for just for you to walk out your house for you just to be just that kind of conscious that level of self-consciousness that has been applied by white people by white supremacy yeah. by racism is something that as white people we don't have to take on like so even though yeah there are places spaces that i'll go into where of course they'll be expecting me to do a certain thing be a certain way but i don't think it's ever been down to the color of my skin but then but then interesting to flip that growing up going into all black spaces as a white person right this is where that was my next question this is where appropriation has been really fascinating for me as as a white person because when i first started to appropriate black culture black people particularly black women because i love black women and because i've always loved black women and had such a connection to black women for me looking back on it i would have thought i was trying to assimilate without realizing right do you understand like the levels of it do you know what I mean? yeah yeah like, yeah like oh but wait if like me and like holly demps do you mean or grace yeah 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 my or white friend are the only white holly's friends. my girl and and holly holly reminds oh, me of you so much holly holly is just everything i just i love oh, that i love that girl but just but just like you holly is unapologetically herself in every space regardless of what might be coming her way. Do you know what I'm saying? And I think that's why people like you, people like her, I can connect with and vibe with because that's my whole bag. I actually don't give a damn what the color of your skin is. If we vibe, we vibe. But the second you make the color of our skin an issue, you're going to find that you've got a problem with me. And I've always been that way inclined. It's like, you know, we talk about, you and I talked about homophobia a little bit on the phone when we spoke the other day. Now, my thing is this. I don't want to see two men kissing in a bus stop, fact. But I also don't want to see a man and a woman kissing up in a bus stop. And I'll tell you why. I simply just don't like public displays of affection. And I also become really, really concerned if there are young people about, just because of what that might look like and the influence that might land on them in this day and age, right? But guess what? If I don't like something, I ain't looking at it. I'm not going to look at it to get myself worked up so that I can go over to those people and start a war. So for me, when you're, when you're in a space where everybody is just welcoming of you, whoever you are, however you are, I can roll with that, I can vibe with that. The second it looks like there's an issue, well, uh, Charlie's ready to, you know what I mean? These guns, they work. <laughs> they work. And I think I'm not speaking on behalf of black people at all. I'm speaking on behalf of me. But I know that I'm at that point. The fire in my belly is a lot. George Floyd was one brother too many, man. One brother too many. Breonna Taylor, one sister too many. I'm so done. If I have to continue the movement on my own, I'm going to continue that movement. I don't business what anyone's got to say, what anyone's got to do. That's one brother, one sister, too rotted many. It needs to stop. But equally, if I saw a white person being vilified, discriminated or anything. I'm the same. I've got to step in. You think I can watch just because a lot of white people are racist. Don't mean they all are. And even if the white person getting beat on is racist, that's still not the way you can't solve any of this mess with more violence. Do you understand? Hence why the police confuse me when they go on these protests saying that they're there to protect, saying that they're there to basically just serve the people. And they're, they're the ones that end up making the trouble. What the hell? And we're there to protest police violence, and then the police are there being violent. <laughs> You're like, what? It, like, it, it, just, it terms, just doesn't make sense. Doesn't how, how is it as, as this, is, this is my last question to you. I think we should get into the game, but I've always been uh, interested. I have black gay friends um, who identify in different ways. So it might be that they want me to refer to them as being black and gay. They might want me to say, no, they're black and, and lesbian, queer, whatever. So the appropriate title for them by way of how they identify is, is what I use, but all of them are black. And so I've had this chat with them, but I've never ever asked a white gay person, is there a difference, do you feel, in terms of the movement with pride, etc., in the way that you're treated today as a white gay man, in terms of how you might have been treated moons ago when you first came out, do people just treat you normally? Or is there none of that? Are you still facing, you know, people who are homophobic? Sure, so... Please tell me no. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, what's, what's so interesting about it is that actually the only times that, so for anyone who's just joined in, I was saying the difference between being white and gay and having white privilege, especially being a white gay man rather than being a white woman who's lesbian, is I have patriarchy and racism seemingly backing me. It leads to much more mental illness, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> Literally! <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of ever receiving any sort of abuse on the, on the street or anything like that, it's only if I'm walking hand in hand with Matthew, which is really sad. Really? Yeah, that's the Today, thing. in the 21st century? Yeah. 
yet. Like, but it's it's rare. Like, is, is, but do you do you think it's because you're white and he's black, or do you just think it's because the two of you are men? This is crazy. It, you know what? It depends. It depends on the circumstance. Like, it depends on who it is. Like, but does anyone say anything to you guys? Oh yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, ah! depend on who it is, they'll shut up. But then also, me and Matthew back it as well. Do you know what I mean? So. Like, but then, but then, saying that I say that we back it, let me not be arrogant in the face of people who have been abused, or even arrogant in the face of myself to a certain degree. Because actually, yeah, I say I back it, that I'll shout back, or that Matthew will shout back. But there's levels to it. Do you know I mean if there's like a whole group of guys, like, yeah, it, like you, it's circumstantial. Do you know what I mean? But I'm oh wow, people get, like, I shout. feel for you that you but you I still face sure, really. I feel like for me, and thank you for that. Like for me, I just use that energy for Matthew in a sense of that. I know that I'm still protected by my whiteness. Like I say, like if I was to let go of Matthew's hand, put on a suit and walk down the street and be all proper and be like, hello, hello. Even not even if I didn't, even me speaking, yeah. me, even me the way being I am, actually, I'm still afforded white privilege. Actually, I even get the privilege of being loved by black people. So it's like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I still have the bubble of white privilege. And that's something that, yeah, no matter how much homophobic abuse I receive, it doesn't- How do you feel about that? How do you feel about your white privilege? How do you feel knowing that you have white privilege? I feel like, as I said, it's been a route to a deep, deep psychiatric condition that I've had to really get to grips with in terms of always wanting to be in control. Always wanting, yeah. like never wanting to be in pain. Like not, yeah. not even being raised to really know how to handle pain. And that's not to say that my mum and dad aren't wow. Wow. and that they haven't lived their lives to their fullest and given me all the love I needed. But I think just as a culture, as white people, the white psychosis of white privilege is that we've taken something that we don't deserve, that we haven't earned, that is not ours. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what can you do? That's, pa that's a powerful, powerful statement. I wish we had all the time in the world to delve more into white privilege, but we just don't. But that's a powerful, powerful statement. Like I'm, I'm prob this is going to be the first live I actually watch back. Because I know I've got things I need to digest. <laughs> Literally. Um, let's get into the game. I love that we've had that conversation. Um, and, and, you know, we can, we can tap a little bit um, more into certain things at the end if, if you want to. But I just think let's take a little bit of a breather and let's have some fun with the memory game. I know you know how this works. Hey, Rex. Hey, Collective underscore Burn. Nice to have you. Uh, yes, Deval, we're going to come back and give you more. We're going to come back and give you more. Uh, Maman Charlotte, I love Maman you, my Charlotte. Stuart. That's Do so. Give a shout out to Maman Charlotte. Of course. She is honestly one of the most important human beings in my entire life. And I urge everybody after this to go to TG underscore foundation on Instagram. Um, Maman Charlotte has a pressure group called Mothers of Congo, uh, where she's worked nice. for the last 15 years against the war in Congo, which is still to facilitate the looting of minerals from, from Congo. I'm about that. I'm yeah. about that. Tatiana, they have a foundation where they raise money to educate children like, uh, who are a product of rape because uh, rape is one of the biggest weapons of war still. Wow, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Congo right now. And just, yeah, I couldn't encourage you guys more. Yeah. Take one thing away. Definitely. From and I'll get all this information from you via WhatsApp and then I can share it. Shout out to Yinka. She's saying this has been great. I saw Sister Shen as well. She says that this is her favorite show. So thanks, oh. girl. Uh, and, and Dwayne is giving you lots of love. All right, let's get into the memory game. For anyone that don't know, the memory game is so simple. It literally is just about having fun. And I'm going to invite you guys to get involved as well. So I have three sets of two words I'm going to give to Stuart. Stuart has to pick one of each word and then give us a story relating to that word. <laughs> so hope you are ready. Okay, we're going to play the memory game. So the first set of words that, that you have to choose from is home or travel? Hmm. Travel. Okay. Okay. They're all tying in, maybe just because of the frequency, and also just because, as you were saying to Holly earlier, like, all of the conversations right now are about the revolution, are about... Yeah. You know, they're about all of it, so it's like they're all tying in together. Um, I went to Mauritius in 2009. Nice. Which was stunning. I'd never been to Mauritius before, and it was stunning. Honestly, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. Like, just paradise the people the food everything just done it sick my friend who i went with i went with her and, and my godson my son oh god i feel a sip of water coming on she didn't realize well okay basically <coughs> Another. the hotel the hotel was colonial themed 
as in themed based on colonial Europe, as in like Mauritius, the island itself, had like duck. <laughs> like, I shouldn't laugh. Oh my God. To the point where when you go into the hotel room, yeah, the first, like on the TV screen, they've got like the video of the hotel. You've got this white woman like in this old like uh, Aston Martin and she's in her hat and it's all in sepia and she's rolling up to the hotel and then as she comes out, it's like, <laughs> it's like I've been and then she's looking at the hotel all in sepia and then as she steps into the hotel, it becomes modern day and it's like, oh, reminisce on the colonial yeah. and I was like, and like the restaurant was called The Plantation. Okay, I'm done. Um, I'm done with you. Then, How have you got this story? <laughs> So I immediately started asking all of the people that were working there. I was like, wait, guys, so also in terms of guests, all of the guests were white. The only guest who wasn't white was my godson, Omar, who I'd gone with. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, speaking to the staff, I was like, wait, guys, like, what, what's going on with the, like, the whole colonial theme? Do you know what I mean? Like, who, <laughs> who, like, like, guys, wait, am I, like, I remember even calling my wow. friends, like, guys, what the fuck, yeah? Oh, what the F, sorry. Don't worry, <laughs> don't worry. worry. <laughs> And, um, and I was like, what? And then I, like this one guy that I spoke to, I said to him like, oh, how do you feel? Like, what's your view on this? And he just looked at me dead in my eye. He was like, my grandparents were slaves. And that was it. And I just was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just Tell like, me you guys did not stay there. No, I left. I, well, no, so my friend ended sick because she'd booked it for a month, yeah. This is, the story also goes in many different tangents, yeah. But I left, I had to leave. Yeah, yeah, it's not about that. Like, it was just I'm gonna say that so far that I think that's the best story that, that I've had. <laughs> and I didn't ex I didn't I didn't expect it. Let me give you your second pair of words. Because otherwise I'll talk to it to it. Okay. <laughs> uh, your second pair of words. Film yes. or moustache. Hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Oh, okay, boom, promo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Rex is saying the best and worst, trust me. TV, right, go for it. Just to give a shout out that uh, what has been really amazing during lockdown has been uh, being with my husband, my partner, Matthew, while he's been writing his pilot of a TV show uh, called Flat White, which is about him working in an office full of white women as a black queer man and just the conversations and the dynamics that play out between a black gay man and Tell me it's a true story. Is it a true story? Of course, yeah. And so, oh my God, I'm here for it. I won't give away any spoilers, or anything, but the amount of things that come out, I'm just like, the world is literally like... Is, Ma is he there? Is, is Matthew there? No, he's at studio. I know. Oh, he's not here because I was... Rubbish. Like, yeah, rubbish. Oh, I'm know. not telling him I'm not happy with him. <laughs> I will. <laughs> 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 Bless him. All right, let me give you your next set of words and then we're going to get uh, the guys watching to be involved. Date or ice cream? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh no, why am I going to even do this to myself? I was going to say I haven't been on that many days, but that's just really just... I'm admitting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, ice cream. Let's go ice cream. Uh, okay. Oh, no, but that's really dry. That's like the driest story ever. No, I don't have a fun it, story. It doesn't matter. Just, basically, I just discovered uh, an ice cream shop around the corner from us called... Um, oh, no, I can't even remember their name. No, I'm going to find this story. Basically, I just found a really bum ice cream shop in my end. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like, that's because of that's because of that's because of the season because it's rona season your I brain mean, is fried they're, just, they're saying that all the essential things have been open so when i went in i was like wait you're telling me that ice cream is essential i mean for some people for, for, for some people ice cream is the one <laughs> ice cream is the one I'm very selective when it comes to oh look i knew i was literally going to mention deval because he's he's obsessed with hog and does um, and he's literally just gone ice cream. Mm. <laughs> Belle's like, that's good enough for me. Hey, Belle. All right, I'm going to open it up to you guys watching. Thank you so much for sticking with us because this has been longer than the half an hour, although we are soon done. Give Stuart some words. Throw some words at him uh, for him to choose to tell you a little story about. What words do you have for Stuart? This is the last round of the memory game. I love this game. So if anyone's got any words... 
throw them at him. He'll pick one and uh, he'll give you a story. Vela's saying boss or uniform. Let's see if anyone else has got any other words that they want to throw in the mix. I can go with, I can go <laughs> Paper with or plastic. Yes, Deval. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paper or plastic. I could go with boss, definitely. Um, okay, cool. Um, I used to work at Gym Box. If any of you guys know Gym Box, the obviously the gym club in London. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pause you and say there's another word, nudes. I mean, you might want to, you might not. So let's stick with boss for now. <laughs> but then you you might have it. Watching. Just actually, just that if you even click on the little photos flower, it there's nudes immediately. Just because I don't know why I've tried to change the folder main picture of the folder but it just keeps it so just yeah just do not get into my phone do not go onto that little photo wow there we go <laughs> don't do it um and boss just that in uh in gym box they were paying people they were paying us seven pound fifty to open the gym at 5 30 a.m when they charge like 120 pound a membership so basically any time that the managers from head office would come in they'd be like oh how are you i'd be like yeah good underpaid that is that would be so it. me though but the difference is i'd be fired on the spot whereas you would get to go to work the following day hey yeah. <laughs> yeah. do you know what this has been lovely and literally i could talk to you forever we know this Thank especially you. from when we talk on the phone um but we do have to wrap it up i really appreciate everyone who's been with us for the duration it's quarter to eight so we've it's, this has been 45 minutes already oh wow okay I know, yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, just I just want to take the time in case anybody needs to jump out the live, um, just to say thank you to everybody for giving me your time. I know I say it every week, but it is because I genuinely appreciate you logging on. I always say it, but there's so much content available online. So when you choose to watch me, I'm like, I have to give thanks for that. So thank you. We're at the end of the uh, show, obviously, and there's just two more things for us to do. I said that it's not about giving tips for surviving lockdown. 12 weeks in, 80 plus days, whatever it's been, we're doing our best to survive lockdown. We've got our ways of coping, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need any tips from me. Um, but what I love you too, Duane. What I would say is uh, because of the time, if you are looking for something to do, if you are looking for something that you can do that will help towards the movement, even though you're not able to go out, even though you might not know what to do from at home online, any habits you know that you have that has not served you well, does not serve you well, does not serve the people that you claim to love well, start doing the work you need to do to get rid of those habits. It could be anything, right? For example, I, I have a really bad habit actually of, um, I've always got so much to say. And sometimes I can be so in the flow and in the moment and with all the passion with what I'm saying, that I forget I need to hear the other person. That's something I need to work on, right? And that will serve other people well, as well as myself. So during this season, if you're struggling with what can I do to support the movement? I can't go and protest. I don't know what to do from home. Just start looking at yourself. What habits do you have that do not serve you well and do not serve your friends well? Start working on getting rid of those. Um, but I'm gonna hand over to the lovely Stuart now. And uh, it's up to you. You can either echo the voice of one who paved the way, uh, <laughs> black or white, because I'm nice. <laughs> or you can send a direct message to the oppressors of today. Or maybe you want to do both. I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll combine both. Um, like when we spoke on the phone the other day, I was like, oh, I'm going to combine it. So the echo that just was the first one that came to me, so I just followed my heart with it. Uh, it's from Fela Kuti uh, at the beginning yes. of his song. At the beginning of his song "Fear Not for Man," which is one of my favorite songs of all time, um, and he's actually uh, quoting uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who was the first president of Ghana. Um, yeah, and he's quote, and the quote is: "The secret of life is to have no fear." Um, Amen. Then straight away, then connected me to one of my favorite clips of Nina Simone. If any of you guys have seen it, where an interviewer is asking Nina Simone what freedom is to her, and then she says, "No fear." Um, and so to have Nina Simone and Fela Kuti as two musicians who my life would not be the same. Sick. The world would not be what it is. The world would. Wait, be it, yeah. Sick. Just, and so just. Yes, Jimmy. <laughs> 
the, so the <laughs> idea of the idea of having no fear, um, which then becomes my message, the idea of having no fear, I think is so important for these times because of course we can't force it and we can't fake it. We can't just decide, okay, all my fear is gone. You know, that for me is right. I would say grace. Whatever you right. God, Allah, Yehovah, that's grace. To be graced with like no fear, to just feel love. But I feel like right. what we can do is aspire. That's what we can do is we can aspire to free ourselves of fear. We can aspire to be more loving. Because really, I do believe that in my own journey and in every white person's journey, the the the, the destination from going from unconscious or conscious racism into being anti-racist is to turn fear into love. Because the whole thing for me is based off of fear. It's based off of hatred. And so to really commit to that, yeah, I think is the echo and the message that I would pass on. Amen. I love that. Thank you. And thank you because it's not, I don't necessarily know that it's easy to be a part of echo or message because of what it means, because of what it can allude to and because of how it can make people feel. But I love that you chose the power of turning fear into something positive. Because essentially when I'm asking someone to echo the voice of one who paved the way, whether that be an ancestor or someone else that's important to them, what I'm asking them to do is to not be afraid. That's, that's essentially what I've done this for. When it comes to Black Lives Matter in support of the movement, you can't afford to be afraid. And that's why I'm saying to people, if you feel that you are afraid or if for some reason you are being held back from, from supporting the movement in any way, shape or form, don't worry about that. Just start with where you are and what you have and work on you. You'll get there. Do you understand? So it's crazy that we didn't even have that conversation, but that's what you touched on. I love it. Yes. I love it. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been a joy, man. It's been a joy. I'm, I'm not friends with Matthew because he wasn't here. And I'm not friends with your phone because uh, you need to sort the volume out. But apart from that, I still love you. <laughs> I love you really. And just thank you for this. Thank you for Amplified. Thank you for your voice. Yeah, thank you're so welcome. Much. Thank you. It's amazing. You it's are amazing. very, very welcome. And love to everyone watching. I wanted just to ask everybody, I know we've been on here for a long while, but if there's anything anybody wants to share or ask, then now is the time to do that. And literally, we're, we're just going to jump off. So if there's anything, Deval, this conversation has been more frank than Lampard. <laughs> He's one of my best friends, and he always has these, these lines, these one-liners, this guy. Deval, you need your own comedy show, mate. You need your own comedy show. In fact, speaking of Deval, he runs a, a podcast called The Flicksters, and it's all about the must-watch movies or movie recommendations, uh, programs on Netflix, etc. It's really, really good. So if anybody um, is interested, go and follow The Flicksters on uh, Instagram. Hey, Hamed, I'm so sorry you've just joined, and we're at the end. Uh, we're literally saying goodbye. I'm going to assume that nobody has any questions or anything that they want to say or share. So I'm going to say goodbye. I'm back next week, Thursday, 7 p.m. with uh, officially the second episode of Amplified. And I cannot wait. Next week, I'm going to be speaking to another young man. And we're going to be focusing on male hair loss. I cannot wait to learn. <laughs> yeah, I really can't wait to learn. And I really can't wait to share uh, with you guys his story. I'm, I'm so, 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 so excited. Um, but yeah, thank you, Deval. Deval's saying thanks to you both. It's really good. All right, I'm going to go. Make sure you follow Stuart at Stuart McKenzie. At Stuart is me on the Instagram. And you can and also Stuart. follow me. And at TG underscore foundation. Yes, do that. Uh, you can see me there at Charlie Jai UK, guys. So if you're not following, get following. I'm back next week, 7 p.m. on the live. Stuart, mwah. God bless everyone. So Take care. Bye. Love you, Dwayne. Bye, bye. Bye, guys. Bye.